Hello everybody and welcome back to a lecture series. I'm Ted, your host, and for this lecture we're going to continue along with our discussion of the um, of the uh, Sasanians and uh, their interaction with the Romans in the Roman Eastern provinces. Um, we're going to conclude that that lecture, that that discussion, and we're going to move on to the uh, reorganization of the Western provinces under the Germanic forces, um, the, uh, the Germanic uh, peoples who came to inherit it, uh, the, the, who came to inherit the, the Western um, provinces of the Roman Empire, namely uh, looking at the uh, the Goths, the Visigoths, and the Ostrogoths, the Franks, and of course the uh, the Saxons and the various Jewish bands, which included the Angles. Um, and we're also going to uh, to examine the uh, the the social and the cultural interactions um, that accompanied the invasions or migrations or the takeovers of the Germanic peoples in the western uh, provinces of the Roman Empire after the collapse of imperial authority uh, in Rome itself. And so to begin with, let's, uh, let's uh, quickly conclude our, our look at the Sasanian Persians. Um, now in the eastern provinces, Aurelian and his successors, uh, they, they, they now recognized that they had to reorganize the eastern frontier, that they uh, needed to uh, repair, they needed to make sure that they, there were timely repairs to the Mesopotamian fortresses. And Aurelian himself constructs, or at least orders the construction of a number of desert fortifications. He improves the, the road networks that link Egypt and Mesopotamia, the, uh, the, the great eastern provinces of the Roman Empire. Um, the desert frontier is now patrolled regularly and the Romans launch more expeditions against the Sasanians. In 282, the campaign was successful, um, but the emperor who led it, the emperor Carus, he is killed by a lightning strike. It's a freak victory. Uh, it, well, not, it's not a freak victory, but it's a freak event at the end of the battle. He's killed by a lightning strike after the battle of, after the victory at the battle of Catisophon. And in 298, the emperor Gallierus, um, he, uh, after a, uh, another Roman victory, um, in, in which the Sasanian Shah Narcissus agreed to surrender strategic provinces in Upper Mesopotamia along the Tigris um, and, and recognizes uh, Roman authority. Um, now, the, the struggle between the Romans and their Persian uh, foes, the uh, first the, the Parthians and later the Sasanians, this struggle um, uh, really harkens back to the the grit and the determination that the Romans showcased during the, uh, the height of the Republic. The Romans come out of this struggle with the upper hand. Um, there are, of course, a lot of major reversals. Um, uh, the, uh, the reign of Shapur, for example, was a, was a, a great travesty, or a great reversal for Roman authority in the East, the Roman security in the East. Shapur sacks many of the uh, great Eastern cities more than once. Um, but the situation, but it is uh, infinitely better uh, than the situation along the Rhine and the Danube rivers. Now, this was a great triumph of the Romans. Uh, they had defeated their most dangerous opponent in the East, uh, and really, they're their most dangerous opponent of the third century. Um, and they and they had largely triumphed. Now, the campaign harkened back to the, had I said, the tenacity of the old legions of the old republic. Um, they regrouped after several defeats and setbacks, and they pushed on until victory was won. And the fortresses constructed by Severus were absolutely vital. They collectively held up the Sasanian advances, uh, allowing the emperors to arrive on the scene, giving the emperors that, that breathing space to, uh, to marshal their resources and to hurry up uh, and get to those eastern provinces to defend those eastern provinces. The Roman successes also depended largely on the loyalty of the Eastern citizens. Um, and you have to remember that it was the Eastern citizens who paid for these wars, who paid the, uh, the salaries of the troops, and they stood by the empire and the emperor through, which was really just a lot of thin. Um, 
uh, there wasn't a whole lot of thickness to the, th uh, the, the third period crisis in the East. Uh, now, now these victories also battered the Roman army um, and it eroded some of the key institutions in the East uh, and really compromised the civic institutions of those Eastern provinces. So the same, uh, the, the same keys to victory were, were eroded by the victory. Um, the security and the peace of mind of the Eastern citizens uh, was eroded. Um, they, this would be one of the reasons why they wouldn't be there, why there wouldn't be such uh, same determined resistance to um, the Islamic invasions in the East, while, why it was uh, a bit easier to come to terms with the Islamic conquerors when they emerged on the scene um, a, a few centuries later. Okay, and now that we've uh, concluded our, our our look at the Persian situation, the, the, the situation along the eastern borders, I'd like to uh, switch our focus. I, I know in our past couple of lectures, we've been sort of um, uh, frog hopping um, from region to region. And that will be a, uh, a recurrent theme from now on. Um, we, uh, we did it a little bit by, by looking first at Mesopotamia and then at Egypt and then at India. Uh, and then we sort of stuck with this, uh, Near Eastern narrative in the early section of it. And then we stuck with a, a, um, a long Greek narrative that transitioned to Macedon, um, that, that, that transition, uh, transitioned to China and then to India and then to Rome, um, with the, uh, with the collapse of the Roman empire, uh, in the West. Um, the world begins to, uh, or at least the world that we've been examining, um, the, this Near Eastern, this Mediterranean-based world begins to fracture. And uh, our, our attention is now going to be pulled into different areas, areas that we haven't uh, truly looked at yet. We haven't looked at the Americas. We'll get to that a little later in the course, toward the end of our course, uh, at least the first half of our course. Um, We'll, uh, we will, we'll go in and we'll do uh, an examination of some of the earlier states in the, e in the uh, Eastern Asia. Uh, we'll go back and we'll look at China after, uh, after the Han. We'll look at um, the Indochine, um, uh, the area that is home to um, Vietnam and Cambodia. Um, well, and then, of course, and of course we'll, uh, we'll transition into looking at uh, Africa and different uh, zones in Africa had they rose. Um, uh, in designing the course, I tried to keep it as chronological as possible, but uh, there are some areas in our, in our next couple of lectures that they're, they're going to be largely thematic. Um, but we will largely return and, and we will continue on with the thematic um, uh, course, well, with this thematic outlook until we get to uh, the age of discovery. After the age of discovery, after um, the Euro uh, Europeans become uh, largely aware of the greater world, we can start looking at things chronologically, really by century, uh, as opposed to by, uh, by, by continent. So uh, we'll be looking at uh, courses in the future by continent, until we get to the age of discovery in which we'll look at things uh, events in world history by century uh, and to begin with let's uh, let, let's transition back to uh, the far extreme of Western Eurasia um, what we call Western Europe and let's look at the various Germanic kingdoms that were organized in the wake of the collapse of Imperial Rome in the West uh, in the Western portion of their empire now in some kingdoms in some of the Germanic kingdoms, continuity was especially strong, and in others, they were especially weak. The Germanic kingdoms, with the strongest links to the uh, to the to the Romans, were the Visigothic kingdom in Spain, the Ostrogothic kingdom in Italy, and of course the Frankish kingdom in Gaul. Uh, what would become France? Now the Visigoths entered the Western Roman Empire back in the, uh, back in the year 377. The Ostrogoths 
um, were Goths. Uh, the Visigoths and the Ostrogoths, they were both members of the Gothic family grouping, uh, but the Ostrogoths did not enter the Roman Empire until after the emergence of the Huns. And the story of how the Visigoths wound up in Spain is a nice illustration of the later Roman policy towards the Germanic tribes. In 409, a group of Germanic tribes crossed the Rhine River after it froze over. Uh, one of these tribes, the Vandals, crossed the Pyrenees into Roman Spain. Uh, the Romans did not have the resources to mount a campaign to root the Vandals out, um, so they called on the Visigoths to expel the Vandals. Uh, in 415, the Visigoths succeeded in pushing the Vandals out of Spain, but the Romans grew fearful that once the Vandals had been dealt with, the Visigoths would simply seize the moment for themselves and, uh, and, and seize Spain. Now, the Romans decided to cut off the Visigoth food supply to encourage them to leave Spain and to head back to their, home, um, their, their homes uh, by the Rhine. This strategy forced the, uh, the Visigoths to withdraw north into Gaul, where they settled. Um, the Goths liked what they seen, what they had seen in Spain, however, and by the time of the uh, the collapse of the Western Empire, um, of the Western Empire's administration, the Visigoths had succeeded in capturing most of Spain. Now, the Vandals by this time had left um, Western Europe, the, the far stream of Western Eurasia, completely. Uh, and they had settled in North Africa, and they founded a kingdom of their own, uh, the, the Vandalic Kingdom of, uh, in North Africa, in the shade of the city of Carthage in the old Carthaginian Empire. Now, the Visigoths, for some time, were able to hold on to both Spain and southern Gaul. However, the Goths suffered a severe military defeat at the hands of the Franks at the... Um, um, at the uh, at a battle fought in 507, which forced them to surrender their Gallic possessions. The Visigoth capital was at the time um, located at Toulouse, um, but as a result of the battle, it had to be relocated to uh, Toledo, and this was uh, completed by 555, by I mean 551, um, the year 551. Now, the Visigoths went, on, uh, went to great lengths to preserve the Roman culture that they found in Spain right up to the end of their kingdom in 711. Uh, the Visigoths adopted many aspects of Roman culture um, that were largely alien to them, much like written law. Um, and, and the Visigoths, uh, they were illiterate. Um, they, they didn't really have writing. Uh, not many of them knew how to write and they didn't have any reading. But their legal system uh, and, and their legal system was based on written law. Now, by contrast, the Romans, um, the Romans fell heir to the great traditions, the great literary traditions of all the civilizations that came before them in the Mediterranean world. Uh, they developed a highly sophisticated jurisprudence, uh, and Roman jurisprudence was based on written laws. The Visigoths decided to write down their laws based on the Roman example, and they began doing so almost immediately after they arrived in Spain. Now, the Visigoths continued to revive their laws, and they were the real trendsetter for the other Germanic tribes. Um, and, and the other Germanic tribe that fell heir to the Roman provinces in the West, they began to organize their traditions and their customs into law codes. Now, the most important addition uh, was uh, of these uh, Germanic law codes was the Lex Visigothorum, um, which is literally just uh, tra uh, Latin translation for the, the laws of the Visigothic kingdom. Now, the local Roman administration remained intact uh, after the Visigothic conquest. The administrators um, now simply work for the Visigothic king rather than the Roman emperor. This is simply, um, if you want to look at it in, in, uh, in corporate terms, uh, you can view it as a hostile takeover and the employees still work for the company, it's just that the company has a new boss. So they, the administrators, these, uh, these bureaucrats, they still work, uh, they, they still do the exact same thing. Um, the administrators of the Visigothic kingdom were lay people and they continued to receive their salary, the salary just now paid by the Visigothic king. Now, the Visigoths were distinct among other Germanic tribes in this regard. Uh, the Visigothic kings consciously modeled themselves on the Roman emperors. They minted coins uh, with, the, with the old slogans of the Roman emperors. They put on similar public displays, uh, notably uh, triumphal displays. After, uh, after their great victories, uh, urban life continued in Visigothic Spain. 
albeit on a more reduced scale. Um, and, and the uh, and the great public uh, institutions, the great the great public facilities that had existed in Roman Spain still existed in Visigothic Spain. Those would be the the aqueducts and the great public baths. Um, they they still functioned. Now their Romanization created a problem for the Visigoths. They were without a doubt the elite in Spain, but they accounted for less than five percent of the Spanish of the uh, population in Spain. There was a danger that they were going to be swallowed up and absorbed by the larger Hispano-Romano population via assimilation. Now, one method they employed to retain their distinctive identity was to restrict intermarriage between the Visigoths and the Romans. Now, ironically, this was another uh, example of the Visigoths borrowing a Roman custom. Uh, the Roman forbade marriages between Roman citizens and non-citizens for centuries. Uh, they clung to the distinct Germanic style of dress. They wore heavy furs in the, uh, in the temperate Spanish, uh, uh, Spanish weather. Um, they retained their language for a while and their own brand of Christianity. Uh, the Visigoths were not originally Catholic, uh, but they did embrace, um, but they did embrace Catholicism later on. Uh, when they entered the Western Empire, um, Chris, they, they were required to adopt Christianity by the Emperor Valens. At the time, there were many competing schools. So we, we, we discussed the competing schools of Christianity. Um, the Visigoths decided to adopt Arian Christianity. Um, uh, the, the Christianity that um, that that uh, presented the uh, the ideological um, notion that Christ was separate from from God and thus not divine um, and, and not of the same essence of God, a a distinct um, uh, a, a a distinction from the the more um, established and by now mainstream um, idea that Christ uh, and God are the same, the, the, the whole basis of the, uh, of the Holy Trinity. Um, the Visigoths adopted Arian Christianity. Uh, now, most of the population of Visigoths of Spain practiced Catholicism. The Visigoths clung to Arianism, and at times they tried to force Arianism on the entire Spanish population. All of these efforts um, to, to resist assimilation into the larger Spanish population pretty much ended in a failure. It, it absolutely ended in a failure. Um, by, by the seventh century, uh, the Visigoths had become completely Romanized. And the Romanization of the Visigoths was so thorough that they left, that, that they still uh, have left very little of an imprint on Spanish or Portuguese um, society today. Um, they, 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 the, the, uh, they, there are a few words that descend from Visigothic uh, German, from the Visigothic German dialect, um, onto the Spanish and the Portuguese and the Catalan and the Basque languages, but it's very minuscule. Um, their, their impact um, was more. Uh, it was more in uh, in simply preserving those Roman customs after the uh, the breakdown of Imperial Rome rather than in uh, completely altering the, uh, the fabric of, of that society. Um, the, the, the greatest impact, I would say, would be the introduction of the Lex Vitigothorum, um, codifying all of their laws. I would say that would be the, uh, the, great, the greatest accomplishment in Visigothic Spain, um, presenting that coherent legal code. Uh, and from and from the Visigoths, we move on to the Ostrogoths. Now, as strong as the Roman influence was on Visigothic Spain, it was even stronger in Ostrogothic Italy. Now, the Ostrogoths uh, crossed the Danube River in 453, and they came on the heels of the Huns, who who they were fleeing from. For two decades, the Ostrogoths settled along the Danube. Uh, but before they relocated to the Balkans, uh, the Balkan regions, um, in 473. Now, the Eastern Emperor decided that he did not want the, um, the Ostrogoths living within his empire, so he decided to hire the Ostrogoths to drive out Odoacer. And Odoacer was the Germanic king, uh, the Germanic warlord, 
who deposed the last emperor in the West, um, Romulus Augustulus. Odoacer had made various gestures of submission to the emperor in the East. Um, he sent the imperial regalia to Constantinople, saying there was no need for an emperor in the West. Um, nonetheless, it struck the emperor that it was just unacceptable to have a Germanic tribal king ruling over Rome and ruling over Italy. The Visigothic king Theodoric, he accepted. And in 488, he launched a campaign in Italy to oust Odoacer uh, from, 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 from Rome. For five years, the two tribes fought it out for control of Italy uh, before they reached the settlement. They agreed to share Italy between themselves. Uh, Theo, uh, Theodoric, um, he then double-crossed Odoacer and he, did, and he took all of Italy for himself. Now, Theodoric, uh, he becomes the new ruler of Italy and he is firmly entrenched as the king of Italy by 493. And he establishes the Ostrogothic kingdom. Um, in theory, he had been acting as an agent of the Roman Emperor, but in reality, he was an independent operator. Theodoric had a deep appreciation for Roman culture. As a boy, he lived in Constantinople as a hostage. Um, he was fully ingrained, and again, he was a hostage in the sense that he was a privileged guest. Um, nasty things could happen to him if his father had disobeyed the Roman Emperor, but in all actuality, he was uh, there uh, to be indoctrinated with Roman culture and to become a good servant of Rome and to keep his people in line, to keep them obeying Rome. Um, Theodoric kept up the appearance of a German tribal king. Uh, he wore a long beard, he had long hair, um, but, but he consciously modeled himself on the customs and behaviors of a Roman emperor, if only to make himself more, po uh, more palatable to the Roman population of Italy. But most suspect that he did so because he, he had um, a deep appreciation, a deep admiration for the position of Roman emperor, for the actions of the Roman emperor. Now, Theodoric and the Ostrogoths, um, for example, uh, they were Arians. Most of the Germanic peoples were Aryans, but they made no attempt to impose Aryan Christianity upon the, uh, the, the, the Catholic population of Italy. Now, Theodoric maintained cordial relations with the Pope. Uh, the Roman government still functioned in Ostrogothic Italy as it had under the Empire. The Senate was still in existence in uh, Ostrogothic Italy. Um, and Theodoric also adopted the public trappings of the emperor, and this included these styles and the titles. Theodoric's court, um, at its court, Roman senators um, are, are, are supported. Um, he, he courts them, he, he brings them into his fold, and he continues to support the public games in Rome. Those would be the, uh, the chariot races at this point. Um, gladiatorial games had been outlawed during the early Christian period of the Roman Empire. Um, Theodoric builds new aqueducts, um, new public baths, um, and throughout Italy, he tried to revive Roman culture, Roman institution. He tried to present himself um, as the Germanic king who was a Roman emperor. Um, he even revived the grain dole for a short period of time in Rome, uh, handing out free grain to the citizens of Rome. Now, the Visigoths and the Ostrogoths were able to attack themselves to Roman culture once in control of the old imperial provinces. Uh, and, and this was because of their long association with Rome. They had long known a Roman custom. They were no strangers to Roman culture. Um, and, and they had, before coming into possession of these old imperial provinces, they had, uh, they, they, they had uh, to somewhat been Romanized themselves. Now, the regions that they settled, Italy and Spain, they were also the areas of uh, the oldest Roman uh, occupation. Uh, Rome, of course, is in Italy, and the Roman first overseas province was in Spain. Roman civilization and identity ran very deep in these provinces. Now, more surprising is the Romanization of the Franks in Roman Gaul. Now, the Franks had not had as much exposure to the Romans and Roman culture um, uh, had, had the Goths had. Uh, the Romans had not possessed Gaul 
for nearly half long had they had possessed Spain. Uh, Spain is added to the Roman Empire during the Punic Wars, during the, uh, the, the, uh, the 3rd century BCE. Gaul is added to the Roman Empire during the, uh, during the, uh, the 50s BCE. Uh, Julius Caesar conquers it right as the imperial phase is beginning. Um, so about, uh... 19 years before the empire is founded, Gaul is brought in. And it's not even Julius Caesar, it's really Caesar Augustus. And it's Caesar Augustus after 31 uh, AD who organizes the Gallic provinces and begins the process of, of, uh, of Romanizing the Gauls. It's, um, it's something that's done in about 350 years, whereas by that time, uh, Spain, and from the very beginning, the Romans have been Romanizing Spain. They, they have been uh, importing Roman culture and, and uh, instituting Roman values into Spain. Uh, for nearly uh, half a millennia, for, for, for a little more than half a millennia, the, the, uh, the Romans have been in Spain and have been laying down the, the networks for, for, uh, for, for, um, for, for Roman uh, culture in Spain. And we must remember that Trajan himself was a Spaniard. So... A much easier task in preserving Roman culture in in uh, in Spain than in Gaul. Now, nonetheless, the the Frankish kings they were they they were able to accomplish a very remarkable thing by keeping Roman culture and institutions alive in Gaul. Uh, the Franks hold the remarkable distinction of being the only German tribal heir of the Western Roman Empire that was never conquered by a foreign power. They stand apart from the Saxons, uh, the Jutes, uh, the Visigoths, and the Vandals. Uh, the Franks, uh, and, and I say this because the, the Saxons and the Jutes, um, they were eventually conquered by both the, uh, the Norman Franks uh, the the uh, the, uh, the Normans, um, this uh, this mixture of uh, Scandinavian Franks um, who uh, invade and they take over, uh, and this is something we'll get into later. But that's the uh, the Norman conquest by William the Conqueror, um, the uh, the Visigoths and the the Vandals. They're conquered by uh, the um, the Islamic Ar uh, armies of the Arabs, and the. Uh, the Ostrogoths. The Ostrogoths are conquered by the, the Lombards, who in turn are conquered by the Franks. Uh, but the Franks themselves, uh, France, uh, their, their kingdom, is never conquered by an outsider. Um, most of France will be swallowed up by um, England during, during uh, their Hundred Years' Wars, and we're jumping into the future. Uh, but, but, uh, but all of France is never swallowed up by the English. Um, for, for much really of Europe, of, uh, of this post-Roman um, Western Eurasia, uh, what we would call Europe, for most of their, of, uh, their history from the year 500 um, up until really um, 1871, it will be a history of other people feeling the, the sting of Frankish or French um, encroachment onto their domains. Um, but we're really jumping the gun on that, and those are things that topics that we'll get into at a later date. Um, the Franks, the only distinction of being the only German tribal heir, not conquered by uh, a foreign power, um, they, they stand apart in that regard, and they were a confederation of many smaller tribes. Under their king Clovis, they began to transform themselves into a unified and a distinct group. And just a little bit on the name Clovis, Clovis is the Frankish German precursor to the later French name Louis. So most people are familiar with the fact that there have been um, 20, uh, 19 I should say, 19. Um, the, Louis, the last Louis was um, uh, the son of uh, Charles, the, uh, Charles the Ninth. Um, no, no, it's Charles the Tenth, I'm sorry. Uh, the the last uh, Bourbon king to uh, uh, of France. Um, he held the position for about 20, 20 minutes before he resigned. Um, he uh, he he traces his name. His name is a uh, is a precursor to Clovis. So Clovis Louis, uh, same difference. Um, Clovis, our our Clovis, our Clovis the first. He rules from four eighty one 
until 511. So immediately after the, the uh, collapse of the Roman Empire in, in the West in, in 476, the Franks begin their um, begin their uh, their reign as the the great powers in, in Gaul. Um, he broke down the semi-autonomous nature of the Frankish Confederation. Um, the, 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 uh, the tribe, the smaller tribe, they came together, but they uh, maintained a, a, a autonomy amongst themselves. Clovis came from the Salian Franks, uh, from the Salian tribe, and they gave their name to um, the law known as uh, the law code, I should say, known as Salic Law. Now, Clovis never identified as king of the Salians. He always identified as king of the Franks. And his career was devoted to assimilating the other Frankish tribes into this new broad Frankish identity. His main rivals were the Raporian Franks, who lived along the Rhine River Valley. Uh, and he brought them under control by, by uh, using underhanded means. He urged the sons of rival chiefs to murder their fathers and after the deed was done, he would simply attack the sons publicly before executing them for, for patricide, before absorbing leadership of that tribe. Now, Clovis' family, the Merovingians, uh, they were ruled over the Franks from his extension in 481 until 751. In addition to uniting the Franks and eliminating potential rivals, Clovis regularly attacked and conquered the various Germanic tribes that had migrated into Roman Gaul. Uh, at the beginning of his reign, the Franks were concentrated in northern Gaul, but Clovis expands throughout Gaul. It was Clovis who defeated the Visigoths in 507, and it was Clovis who seized uh, Toulouse and southern Gaul from the Visigoths. Um, the most important legacy associated with Clovis was religious. Uh, he, unlike most other Germanic leaders, converted to Catholicism. Uh, the fact that he converted to Catholicism was a great boon for Catholicism. The, uh, the, the ranks... Uh, um, um, the, the rank uh, of the, uh, of the um, Catholic Church and, and, and Gaul were to be filled with Franks. Uh, he, he spurred this uh, this conversion and he spurred this adoption of Catholicism among the Frankish people. And the Franks really would become the dominant Germanic power in Europe until the uh, the 19th century. So uh, for for roughly uh, roughly like 1500 years, the Franks would be at the center of all the events of Europe. Um, in the in the, uh, in the Frankish kingdom, there was less survival of Roman culture than in Visigothic Spain or Ostrogothic Italy. Uh, the Frankish kingdom would deviate from Roman custom and tradition in one major way. Um, the, Frankish, uh, the Frankish kings, uh, they would divide their holdings among their sons. Uh, the Roman emperors never divided the empire among their sons. The empire was a separate entity, separate from your private patrimony or inheritance. Uh, the Visigothic kings and the Ostrogothic kings, they understood this, uh, and they understood the strategic importance of not alienating their kingdoms. They do not divide their lands among their sons. The Franks did not. They did not distinguish between the kingdom and their personal property. They regarded the kingdom as their personal property. They began the practice of dividing the kingdom among their heirs. This would be a very prominent feature of Frankish rule. Uh, they then would engage in destructive civil wars to reunite the whole kingdom. Um, another distinguishing trait of the Frank, uh, of Frankish administration was the dropping of the name Gaul um, to refer to their portion of the, the remnant of the Roman Empire. Uh, the Visigothic Kingdom retained the name Hispania in the form of Espana. Uh, and Espana is the modern Spanish name for for Spain. Um, and, it's, and it's really a misnomer because Espana, e Espana and Hispania refer to the entirety of the Iberian Peninsula. Um, the visit the Ostrogoths. The Ostrogoths retained the name Italia for Italy, um, and and still even in the modern Italian language, Italia is Italy. Now, the Frankish kingdom 
was never referred to as Gaul. It's, never, it's only referred to as Frankish Gaul um, for uh, historical purposes, but it was known as Francia from the beginning. Uh, that, that, that's what the Franks referred to it as, Francia. Um, and, and that later becomes France. Um, despite these breaks with the uh, Roman past, there are many continuities with the Roman past and Francia. Uh, language. Language with the exception of a small wedge along the Rhine River where the Franks retain uh, a Germanic language, the rest of the Franks, um, the, the rest of the Franks um, develop a, a Romance language that, that is an evolution of Latin. Uh, and that language, of course, will be France, will, will, will be uh, French. Um, there's also a continuity in urban dwelling. Uh, the towns are smaller, but they are still present and, uh, and, and they're still home to commercial and urban, and, and, uh, urban production centers. Uh, in the cities, the Frankish kings sponsor the same games that the Roman emperors do. Uh, Frankish kings continue minting coins with uh, Roman emblems until the end of the 6th century. Uh, the Franks retained the social distinctions that the Romans had. That is, in distinguishing between patricians and non-patricians, um, and also from Franks and Romans. In the 7th century, the, distinguishings, uh, the, the distinguishments begin to weaken. Uh, the senatorial aristocracy disappears, um, and, uh, and, and it is replaced, really, by a warrior elite. Uh, and these will be remembered um, in later. Uh, French tradition had the nobles of the sword. Um, uh, one, one of the uh, noble distinctions within later French society that, that we'll get to a little later. But a warrior elite um, aristocracy displaces the old senatorial aristocracy. Um, the differences between a Roman and a Frank can no longer be made because they are assimilating. Uh, there is a shift from holding a victory triumph um, from, from inside the towns to the countryside as urbanism begins to die down. Uh, the Franks abandoned the Roman monetary system of minting uh, coins in silver, copper, and bronze. The Franks only mint coins in silver. The emergence of the Gothic Franks uh, of the Gothic and Frankish kingdoms complicates our knowledge or understanding of the fall 